Okay, welcome everybody. We're just about ready to get started here. Um, for today's webinar, we're going to be using chat. It's going to be in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, all I ask is that when you get ready to send your message, if you can make sure that it says where it says send to, make sure that it says all participants or everyone, and that way everybody can see the question that you're asking and we can get it answered. Um, and again, as a reminder, uh, if you send me an email at taxtraining at tax.idaho.gov, I can send you these presentations in a PDF format. And the email address should be the first thing in the chat window right now. Uh, I am recording this webinar. Um, I will send out an email link to everybody uh, once I have this thing rendered and uh, posted up on YouTube. It usually takes about a week or so. Today we're going to have uh, presenters from uh, the Idaho uh, State Tax Commission, so Cynthia Adrian from the Governmental Affairs Office, and then from, uh, from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, which is an, or TAS, which is an independent organization inside the IRS, we have Don Baltadonis, who's going to be presenting as well. Uh, I expect there to be almost 60 people in here, so it's going to get kind of busy. Um, you don't have to raise your hand to ask a question, uh, just type it in the chat. And then uh, I will actually interrupt <laughs> either Cynthia or Don at some point and make sure that uh, we get your questions answered, okay? So with that, anything else I need to do? I don't think so. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me give the magic presenter ball to Cynthia. Maybe. Hey, Cynthia, you ready? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, perfect. Let's get going then. So this is our Get Ready to File Your 2023 Tax Presentation. Um, everybody should be getting ready to file those taxes. You should be getting all of that information in your mailbox and uh, email box and whatever. So um, let's get started, and I'll tell you what we here at the State Tax Commission need to see from you. John Baltadonis will be telling you what the um, IRS and the federal side of it is going to look like. So with that, OK, maybe I don't know how to advance these. Where is my, there we go. OK, so both the IRS and the Tax Commission began processing returns January 29th. That was a little over two weeks ago. Um, so. All Idaho returns that are e-filed go to the IRS electronically first, and then they come to us. So once you hit the button on your software, it will transmit it to both of us. So that's a good thing. So here is a screenshot of our website. Our website is a great resource for you to get all kinds of information, answers to common questions, forms and instructions. You can pay your taxes, and of course, you can check your refund status. So there's a lot going on on this page, and I would, if I were you, make myself familiar with this. Um, it can answer a lot of questions for you. And here's also a screenshot of one of the pages on our website. It shows some of our tax videos that we have. So if there's something that you need um, some special instructions on, you can go here um, on our YouTube channel and look for maybe we have a video on it. So if you need TAP help. So TAP is our taxpayer access point. Um, that's a place where you can file um, like sales tax, re I think sales tax, I know you can do withholding, but there are various things you can do through TAP. And so if you have questions about how to navigate TAP, I know there's a video out there that tells you how to do that. And of course, there's a lot more videos there. So um, just check that out. All right, so the first question is, do I need to file an Idaho income tax return? And the answer to that question is, well, if you're an Idaho resident, the answer is probably yes. Um, if you think of Idaho as your permanent home, it's where you live, it's where you come back to after vacations, it's where you bank, your kids go to school here, you vote here, or you register your car here, then you are an Idaho resident, and so you would 
more than likely need to file an Idaho return. You're also a resident if you maintain a home here uh, the entire year or you spend more than 270 days. So maybe you're retired and you spend winters out of state. You go to Florida, Arizona, somewhere like that. Um, or maybe you travel for work. But Idaho is still where you live. Idaho is where your family is. Um, you know, so this is where you come back to. So you would be considered an Idaho resident. And the other thing is, is if you file a federal tax return, you're going to need to file an Idaho tax return. So just keep that in mind. And here are our resident refi filing requirements. So you can see on this table um, from what your gross income is and your age and your filing status all determines if you need to file. So for example, if you're single and under 65, and your gross income is over 13850 so I'm following the top line of the chart. Um, so you would need to file a return. So um, just something else that I might point out is that um, a lot of people think that they should run their taxes both ways if they are married and trying to decide if they should file jointly or separately. I would caution you that Idaho is considered a community property state, so it's really not that simple because basically half of one spouse's income belongs to the other spouse and vice versa. The same for withholding. So some things aren't allowed if you file married filing separately. So um, if you have questions about that, you can definitely contact us, but it might be better to contact a tax professional to help you decide the best way to file if you're in that area and trying to figure out what the best way would be for you to file. So in Idaho, not all uh, states that file income tax returns have what's called a part-year resident. Everybody has residents and non-residents. Idaho has part-year residents. And part-year residents are if you lived here but you move outside of Idaho or you move to Idaho after you've lived somewhere else, uh, you move back to Idaho after a temporary absence. So those are people who would be part-year residents. So let's talk about what happens with those part-year residents. So for a part-year resident, you would file a return and report all income sources while you're a resident, so after you've moved here from another state, and from all Idaho income sources while you were a non-resident. So say you are um, a resident of California. You decide to move to Idaho, but while you were living in California, you had a rental house here, and you were earning Idaho income. So that would be your Idaho income source while you're a non-resident. And then once you move here, all of your income sources, so whether it is um, interest, whether it's wages, anything like that that you receive as a resident is taxed. And if that those two things equal more than $2,500, then you need to file an Idaho part year resident return. And that is a Form 43. So a non-resident, who's a non-resident? So if your permanent home was outside Idaho for the entire year, then you're considered a non-resident. And yes, non-residents can have Idaho source income. So let's talk a little bit about what that could be. So that could be wages earned in Idaho. You could actually be a resident of another state, say you're a resident of Oregon but you drive across the border and earn wages in Idaho. If you earn more than $2,500 in Idaho source income, you might need to file an Idaho return. Um, if you have rental property or business income, you might need to file an Idaho return. I will interject here as well that if you have to file in Idaho and another state, we have something called a credit for taxes paid to other states. So if you pay tax on the same income in two 
states, then one of those states will give you a credit for tax paid. And usually it would be the non-resident state. So um, just be aware of that. Active duty military. So active duty military has a few different rules. I would encourage you, we do have a good military page on our website, so I would encourage you that if you are military to check that out. Um, everything's usually determined by the domicile state. However, there has been a new um, federal law that was passed, and it makes it so that the uh, military person and their spouse can determine where they would like to file their taxes. And that can change um, year to year from what I understand. So just be aware of that. If you're domiciled in Idaho, we consider you an Idaho resident. Uh, you would file an Idaho resident return. If you're domiciled in another state, no matter what state it is, then you're considered a military non-resident. You would use the Form 43 as a military non-resident. So here's a little bit more information about active duty military. Um, if you're an Idaho resident, of course, Idaho taxes your military and non-military income earned. We don't tax military pay uh, that residents out, stationed outside of Idaho earn. And, but we do tax income that spouses earn in Idaho if they're an Idaho resident. And then on the flip side, you can see what happens if you're a military non-resident. We don't tax active duty military pay. Um, any other income received from Idaho sources would be taxed. Um, and we don't tax income a spouse earns in Idaho if they share the same domicile state. So say that they are saying that they are domiciled in Washington, then we would not tax that. Again, like I said earlier, we do have a great military page, so check that out if this applies to you. So there could be other times you'd want to file an Idaho return, even if you don't really have to file a return. If you have had Idaho taxes withheld from your paycheck, so you've gotten that W-2 from um, whomever it is, and you see down at the bottom where we have these red circles that there's state income tax, and you look over to the left and the state says Idaho. You might want to go ahead and file just so you can get that withholding back as a refund. Even if you didn't make enough money, you can get that state income tax that was paid in on your behalf back as a refund. So be aware of that as well. Again, here's our website. Yes, I'm going to inundate you with what our website looks like because it has a lot of good information. You can get those forms, whether you're looking for individual forms or business forms. Um, it's all right there. There are um, instructions attached to those as well. So um, be aware of that. Most of your documents are sent by February 1st. Yes, we're past February 1st. Um, and you may not have all of your documents yet. I don't have all of mine yet. I have my W-2s, and I have my information on the mortgage interest I paid and on my interest that I earned, what little it was, I guess, from my savings account. But I don't have my 1099Bs yet. Um, those are from, like, brokerage statements uh, where you might have stocks. So those don't usually don't come, at least I don't see them until the end of February. And I don't think by law that they are required to send them until the end of February. So um, just be on the lookout for those. But if you've moved, please make sure you update your address with your banks and your former employee employers because um, those may not get to you like you think that they should. So. Make sure you get those things updated. And if you don't get a form that you're looking for, contact the person you're expecting it from. They're the ones that can get you that form. Um, we can't get that copy for you. We would not be able to contact a former employer or something and get that information. So you would have to get that instead of us. Here are some of those documents, like I said, that you could be looking for. Uh, W-2 should already be out. 
1099Gs, if you were unemployed during the year and got um, unemployment wages, those should be sent to you. Uh, 1099INTs, so that interest from banks. 1099D, if you have dividends, R for require retirement accounts, and K1s, if you are a partner in a partnership or a shareholder in a, an S Corp, you could be getting K1s from them. Um, here's a few more. So like I was talking about, mortgage interest, student loan interest, um, and so then besides those, at the bottom you're going to see there's three that say receipts. So if you've made charitable contributions, say you have taken something to the Idaho Youth Ranch, to the Salvation Army, somewhere like that, you should make sure you have all of those receipts handy. Any of your medical expenses that you've paid out of pocket. So gather all of that stuff up um, and have it in one place ready when you sit down to do your taxes. That's kind of what I do. Um, I, I keep a manila envelope and I keep it all during the year. And I put the year on it and as things come in or as I pay things or take things to like the youth ranch, I will put that receipt that I get in that envelope. And then when I get ready to do my taxes, I go grab my manila envelope and it has everything that I need in there. So just a little tip, that's, that's kind of how I do it. So if you're using a tax preparer, which some people would rather use a tax preparer instead of trying to do it themselves. But if you do use a tax preparer, make sure you bring in your Social Security cards, including those cards for dependents. Make sure you have birth dates for everybody, driver's licenses, or ID for both the taxpayer and the spouse, all of those tax documents that we were just talking about, a copy of last year's tax return, especially if you've changed preparers. Um, say you moved here from another state and now you're going to use an Idaho preparer. Bring last year's returns, even though it may be a California state return, you would still have your federal return. So bring all of that with you. The tax preparer will want to look at that as well. Um, and any custody agreements that you may have for dependent children, those will be important to the preparer when they're filing your return. Also tell them if you've moved, you got married or divorced, you bought a house, you went to college, you had a child, adopted a child, all of that information is important to those preparers. So um, they know kind of how you filed in the past and can kind of see um, how things go. So. Again, let's look at what is taxable income. So what do you actually include on your return? So as we were talking earlier, if you're a resident, everything you earn from all sources, no matter where, is taxable in Idaho. You're an Idaho resident, so everything you make is taxable. Um, it, and again, like I said earlier, if some of that income is taxed by another state, we'll give you a credit for taxes paid to the other state. If you're a non-resident, we only tax the income from Idaho sources. That's it. And then a part of your residence, like a hybrid of both of those. We're going to tax all of the income you get while you're a resident, and then while you're a non-resident, we tax that Idaho source income. So just be aware of that. And what is taxable income? Taxable income is wages. Unemployment is taxable. Um, while you may have had federal taxes withheld from un unemployment, you may not have had Idaho and probably didn't have that withheld, but it's still taxable income. Um, with t retirement withdrawal, so depending on what type of retirement account you have, if you took a withdrawal, you may owe income taxes on that withdrawal. If you have a share of a business, then we would tax your share of the business income. And then if you had side jobs, so maybe you drove for Uber or Dash or you sell stuff on Etsy, so the income you make after expenses is taxable. So that's why it's a really good idea to be organized and save your receipts for expenses. Um, and that income is also subject to self-employment tax 
if you have earnings of $400 or more. And Don may get into that a little bit more because that's actually an IRS requirement. It's not an Idaho requirement. OK. Let's see what else we have. Grocery credit. Idaho has a grocery tax credit. And the credit is actually to try to help reimburse people for the tax that they pay on groceries. Um, in Idaho, all of your groceries are taxed, or most of them at least are. Um, so Idaho's grocery tax reduces the taxes you owe or adds to your refund. The credit's up to $120 for people under 65, and it's up to $140 for people over 65. And it's for each person on your tax return, so it includes your dependents. So for example, say you're a married couple with two kids, you would have how much? Um, 120 times 4 is $480. So that's what you would get um, on your tax return. It would just reduce what you owe, or it would add to the amount of refund you would be getting. Um, if a taxpayer was deceased during the year or a child was born, you get the grocery credit the full for the full year, no matter when that happened. And part-year residents will get the grocery credit for the time that they're Idaho residents. So be aware of that. All right, more about the grocery credit. So um, if you're a resident or a part year resident and you aren't required to file an Idaho income tax return, you can file a Form 24 to get your grocery credit. Just be aware that if you're filing a Form 24 um, to get your grocery credit, you have to be over 65 and you have to um, not need to file an Idaho income tax return. There's more information on our website and in our in instruction booklet about the grocery credit. I actually did a presentation yesterday to an elderly group, um, and they were asking me about food stamps. And so for any um, month or part of a month that you get food stamps, then you, um, you're not able to file a Form 24. But if you file a Form 40, as a resident, you can get um, the grocery credit for the months that you did not have food stamps. So just be aware of that. Hey, Cynthia, we do have a question. OK. This is for the grocery credit. Do I need to manually add that into my return, or does it automatically apply to my tax return? So there is a line on the, both the Form 40 and the Form 43 where you will need to input that information. Um, if you're using software, we'll probably do that for you as you're working through the software. But there is a line that you will need to enter that information. OK. Let's talk about a few things that are just for Idaho. Idaho has a few things, um, a few deductions that you might want to take a look at. So they are the first time home buyer's deduction the college savings deduction, and the employer college savings contribution. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those in turn. So the first time home buyers, um, it allows qualified Idaho taxpayers to save for their first home and to get a tax deduction for it. So who are qualified taxpayers? So it must be their first home purchased. You can never have owned a home before anywhere. You have to live in Idaho and have to have filed an Idaho income tax return in the most recent year. You have to open a first time home buyer account at an Idaho financial institution. Um, and if you're married filing joint, at least one person has to be a first time home buyer. So not both, but at least one of them must be a first time home buyer. So how does it actually work? So you can contribute up to $15,000 if you're single, $30,000 if you're married filing jointly each year. And then you can take a deduction for your contributions and your interest on your tax return. 
That will be on a Form 39R. It's not on the main form. It's on our supplemental schedule, and then it flows back over to the Form 40. You can deposit up to $100,000 over the life of the account. So for you know married filing jointly, you can do it for three, a little over three years. If you do it each year and take the max um, and deposit over $100,000, the only caveat is that you have to use the money to pay eligible home buying costs. So that would include a down payment to buy a house, any costs, fees, taxes that are charged to you for purchasing that home. And of course, we have more information on our website. I would caution you, though, that if you use the $100,000, so say you get $100,000 in there, and after a while you go, you know, buying a house just didn't for me. I think I'm going to take the $100,000, and I'm going to buy a new car and take a short trip. Well, you will have to tell us that you have withdrawn that and not used it to buy a house, and you will be taxed on it. So just be aware of that before you put money in this account, that it has to be used to buy a house. You can't use it to do anything else. Let's look at the college savings deduction. So this is actually um, a federal program, but Idaho has their own college savings program, and it's called IDEAL. And it allows you to save for education expenses and get a deduction. So you can contribute up to $6,000 if you're single, $12,000 married filing jointly. Of course, you have to use the funds to pay qualified education expenses, and there's more details on our website as to what qualified education expenses are. And um, then there's also an employer deduction, so or actually a credit. Employers can get a tax credit if they contribute to their employee ideal accounts. Um, so if that's something that interests you, take a look at what we have on the website um, about this. So how should you file your return? And I don't know why I put snail mail first, but we did. Um, you can, of course, mail it to us. You need to include all copies of your W-2s and your 1099s. Include a copy of your federal return because Idaho's resident return, Form 40, starts with your Fed AGI, and that is Federal Adjusted Gross Income. Once you figure out your federal return, then you're going to have a starting point to start for Idaho. So make sure you include a copy so we can kind of check and make sure that there's not a discrepancy between what you have on your federal return and what you start with for Idaho. Also make sure it's postmarked by April 15th. So this year it is April 15th. There's some years that we have to adjust for Emancipation Day, but this year we don't. The other way you can file, of course, is to e-file. That's the way that we encourage people to do so. It's more secure because you're not mailing documents with social security numbers. You're not putting those in a mailbox somewhere uh, and opening yourself up to possible identity theft. It's faster. We don't have to re-enter your paper return. It just comes right to us. It may speed up your refund, or will probably speed up your refund if you're getting a refund. Also, if you owe, you can e-file as soon as you want to, but you don't have to pay until April 15th. So if you want to get your return in and you know that you're going to have to pay, you can still file it. We can get it processed, and then make sure you send us that check by April 15th. When you e-file, you're going to get a confirmation that we received it. Uh, there's no standing in line at the post office to make sure that they postmarked it with the right date. It's just here. And there, of course, are many programs and online services that can help you prepare your taxes and e-file them for you. We don't endorse any program, but all of them can help you figure out where to enter things. And of course, they do the math, so you don't have to look for those um, errors of maybe inputting something wrong. Okay, 
You can also file for free. And I think there's a lot of people who don't realize that they may qualify to file for free. So if your federal adjusted gross income that we were just talking about that you compute on your federal return, if it's $79,000 or less, you might qualify to file for free. So check it out on our website. You can see here where we have it pointed to that you can click there and it gives you a list of free file partners and those requirements for each of them. So you can pick one and um, maybe get your free e-file. Some of these services have versions that do cost. So if you're looking to free e-file, make sure you use the link on our website to do that, just so you make sure that you have the free e-file. A lot of people want to know, where's my refund? And you can see again on our home page of our website that um, you can click there where it says, where's my refund? And then you're going to get to a page that looks like that. And you can look at your refund status. If you look um, up here, it says refund status, and there's a refund status page. And you can actually track where it's at. It will walk you through and tell you where in the process your refund is. So um, there's actually four stages, and you can just tell where it is and if it's on its way to you or not or if it's hung up somewhere. Um, so if you've e-filed, you can expect your refund about seven to eight weeks after you get an acknowledgment that we have your tax return. If you file on paper, it takes about three or four weeks longer. So, or three weeks, I guess. So um, just be aware of that. Again, e-filing is our preferred method of people filing. I know that there's still some people out there that would rather file by paper. So you can either mail it to us if you're in the Boise area or in an area where we have one of our field offices. You can actually walk into one of those offices and hand us your return. So that's also an option. If it's your first time filing an Idaho income tax return, it's going to take about an additional three weeks because we have to get your information input in our system. So it just takes more time for us to do that. So what actually slows down your refund? So if you're paper filing and you forgot to include your W-2s and your 1099s, that's going to slow it down. If we don't have a copy of your federal, that's going to slow it down. Um, any kind of math errors, or if we can't read your handwriting. So be really careful when you're inputting that. Sometimes a 3 may look like an 8 or vice versa. Or so you know, a 1 could look like a 7. Just be very careful if you're going to handwrite your return that we can read what you put in there. Um, if you're e-filing, any kind of data entry errors are going to slow your refund. And if you didn't provide an ID, then that's going to slow it down. Um, for all filing, if you claimed a dependent that someone else claims, so we here at the Tax Commission call those double claim dependents because two people claim the same dependent. So that will stop both returns that have claimed that dependent. And then we'll have to figure out who actually is eligible to claim that dependent. If you've used an old address, then you know we have a hard time matching that up with um, the correct person. Also, if you didn't verify your identity, if we have asked you to do so and you haven't done that, then it's just going to take longer and longer for us to get that uh, processed for you. So again, taxes are due April 15th, 2024. If you're mailing your payment, please include a voucher with it. If you're using direct debit, provide that bank account information and the date that you want to debit it. <coughs> Excuse me. You can also use our quick pay option at tax.idaho.gov. That's an easy way for you to do a one-time payment of your taxes. You don't have to set up an account. You don't have to remember usernames, passwords, any of that. You can just go in and say, I want to pay my taxes 
and you can do so on our quick pay. Um, extensions. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to have an extension to file. Yeah, you have an extension to file, but it doesn't give you an extension to pay. Your payment is still due April 15th, no matter when you actually file your return. So just be aware of that. If you don't pay by April 15th, there will be interest that accrues and penalties that will happen for late payment. Um, and if you can't pay all at once, so say you um, calculate your return and you go, oh my goodness, it, there's more than I expected, I can't pay it. Go ahead and file your return on time and then contact us, whether you do it by phone, by email, um, however, contact us and say, you know, I, I just can't do it. And we can set up a payment plan for you and get it paid in a timely manner. Just don't ignore us. Um, that's probably the worst thing you can do is just, just ignore it and think it will go away because it will not. So if you're going to use a tax preparer, you can use irs.gov to find an enrolled agent. Um, Don can probably tell you more about that than I can. Um, the Idaho State Board of Accountancy, you can verify if somebody's actually a, a CPA. And I would make sure if you're going to use somebody to make sure that they're actually a legit CPA. Um, not that there are bad actors out there, but there could be. So just make sure that um, you verify that. You can also use a national chain of tax preparation firms. There are a f quite a few of those out there. So you can use that option. The other thing that I encourage people to do is get recommendations from friends and family. So somebody that they have used before and they can say, you know, they've really done a really good job for me. They've helped me. Um, find all of the deductions that I am due, and they're very conscientious, and so that's always a good way to find a tax preparer. So some more tips about choosing a tax pro is ask them if they e-file. Um, it's faster, of course, and more secure, so I would make sure that they at least offer the option, especially if that's what you want to do. Make sure you ask them about their fees ahead of time. Um, a reputable preparer will give you an idea of what the cost will be. Um, they should be able to look at your prior return that they that you've brought into them and be able to determine, you know, about how much it would be. Make sure you never sign a blank form um, and always look at your return before you sign it. This is true even if you have a family member or a friend that helps you prepare. It's your tax return. And when you sign down there, there's a little statement that it says, I attest that this is true and correct to the you know, best of my ability. And even though you may not have um, prepared it and you may not know a whole lot about taxes, you should kind of have a good idea. And, and if it shows that you owe a bunch of money, ask. Even if, if it's a friend or a family member that's preparing it, go, hey, can you, can you walk me through this and show me why I owe this much money? So um, again, avoid any preparer that bases their fees on your refund. If they tell you I can get you a $1,000 refund, they don't know that without putting your information in and um, then figuring out what your refund would be. And again, avoid preparers that's going to guarantee your refunds. Um, and make sure your refund's going into your account. So if you decide to have your refund direct deposited, make sure that routing number and account number are your routing number and account number for your bank. Because there have been bad actors who will go in and change those. And then you end up and don't get your refund. So um, just be careful about that. And it looks like, Steve, maybe we have another question before I move on to the W-4 and Idaho withholding. Yep. 
It says, my understanding is that tax liability for the entire tax year can be paid in one single payment on or before the 15th of April. In other words, Idaho does not require estimated quarterly tax payments like the federal IRS requires, but rather only one payment for the full year. Is that true? Yes, that is true. So Idaho does not require estimated quarterly tax payments. You can make estimated payments if you um, think you're going, going to owe a bunch and you'd like to make payments throughout the year, you can do that, but it's not required in Idaho. So yes, that is true. So the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is your W-4 and Idaho withholding. So you're saying, well, how does this tie in to my tax return? Because when you do your tax return, <clears throat> there's a line on your tax return that says, income tax withheld. And it's not only federal, but it's Idaho. And if you don't have enough withheld, that's what makes you have tax due a lot of times. So let's look at, these are the federal and the Idaho W-4, and you're going, wait a minute. When I started my job, there was only a federal one. Yes, you're correct. Um, when you start a job, an employer has you fill out a W-4, and a lot of times people don't make changes when life happens. So you get married or have kids and then you forget to fill out a W-4. That happened to me after I started the tax commission. When I started at the tax commission, I had two boys still living at home and they were my dependents. And then after they left home, it was like, wait, I probably should have changed my W-4 because I was not having enough um, tax withheld. So um, just make sure you think about that. I encourage everybody usually at the beginning of every year to go out and look at their W-4 and see what they have on it to make sure, especially if you end up and owe taxes, um, this can be a good way to uh, make sure that you don't have a big tax bill at the end, at, in April. So. Well, let's go back to the fact that we have two W-4s now, uh, a federal and an Idaho. And the thing was that in 2017, federal taxes had a lot of changes with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we found that using the federal W-4 wasn't always giving Idahoans the correct withholding for Idaho. So we developed our own W-4. So when you start a new job in Idaho, you should be filling out both a federal and an Idaho W-4, just so you make sure you get the correct amount of withholding for both. So that's what I would encourage you to do. And you can visit our homepage and find both of those forms there. Um, if your employer doesn't have, when, you know, say you start a job and they hand you a federal W-4 and you're here in Idaho, you should be saying, okay, and where's the Idaho W-4? And if they don't have one, then it's your turn to educate them and say, okay, you need to go to the Tax Commission's website and click on where it says update your W-4 and get a copy of that form and make sure you get those filled out. One thing I do want to make sure we touch on a little bit is to protect your identity. That's very important. Um, when you file your return, sometimes we can send you a letter that will ask you to verify your identity. We, why we're doing that is to make sure that it's you that's filing your return. Um, so if you receive a quiz or a PIN letter, we need you to go out and verify your identity. Um, if you think that you've been a victim of identity theft, then you, you need to use the federal form 14039 um, and fill that out and send a copy to the tax commission or report it online. <clears throat> so to go back to this PIN letter, we could ask you um, to enter a, a personal identification number that we provided. It could be a quiz letter that asks you to uh, verify your identity or we may ask you to provide copies of documents. So again, 
if you don't provide those documents, that's going to slow down your refund, as we were talking about earlier. So just be aware that if, if we send that to you, it doesn't mean that you're a victim of identity theft. It just means that we want to make sure that it's you that's filing this return. And you can always follow us. When I first started the Tax Commission, we didn't have all of this social media stuff. Um, so we actually have accounts on Facebook, on what used to be Twitter, which is now X, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and then we have our YouTube channel. So you can also subscribe to our, our newsletters. Uh, the address is down below here, this tax.idaho.gov slash about us slash stay informed, and they only come out when there's important information that we want to share, so it shouldn't really fill up your inbox, um, but that's a good way to keep abreast of what's going on here. And then my last slide, guys, is if you have any questions, you can always send us an email, um, you can call us. Just be aware that at peak times, it's, you might be on hold for a long time. You can also mail us, or you can visit tax.idaho.gov. You can find a local office. So we have offices in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Lewiston, of course, Boise. We have one in Twin Falls, Pocatello, and Idaho Falls. So they're kind of spread around the state. Um, so you're always welcome to walk in there. There are forms that are available. You can get help from one of our employees that work there. Um, you can drop off your tax return. So just be aware that that's available. And so Steve, that's all I've got for now. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, if there are any questions, go ahead and type them in chat. Um, let's go ahead. Let's take like three minutes, take a quick three minute break, and then we'll have Don uh, from the Tax for Advocate Service uh, as our next presenter, okay? So we'll see you in about, uh, about 10 till. Hey Steve, can you hear me? Yes ma'am, how are you? Awesome, pretty good, how are you guys doing? Doing pretty good. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well I will kind of jump right into it. Um, good afternoon everyone, um, I am Don Bobsadonis. I am I represent the Taxpayer Advocate Service. We are, or TAS for short, little known part of the IRS, but uh, the IRS, I'm the local taxpayer advocate here in, in the state of Idaho. Uh, today I'm going to go over some of the most common errors that occur when filing federal tax returns and tips, and provide some more tips on how to avoid these pitfalls. I'll also be covering some of the most common tax scams because they seem to be on the rise and schemes that you should be aware of and uh, be able to avoid. You remember where my little arrow is? There it is. Good. Okay, so I know everybody is anxiously uh, awaiting, or well, I'm sure everyone's eager to file your tax return, but and get any refund that's due to you. Uh, before you get started, though, um, I want you to follow these tips to prevent, again, common federal tax return errors that delay return processing, including delaying refunds, uh, so your tax return is ready to go. So. Um, always use the information reported on any year-end income statements, your Forms W-2s, your 1099, 1099-K, maybe Schedule K-1s, uh, 1099 miscellaneous, et cetera. Uh, your employee, employer generally has until January 31st to send these year-end year wage-related statements to you. Typically, they start arriving by mail right after the beginning of February, but some employers send them digitally, too. Uh, be aware that your last pay stub may not match your W-2, especially this last year. Year end was December 31st, and yeah, uh, <laughs> was usually the start of the next year's pay period. But if you use that pay stub information instead to file early and it doesn't match exactly, it will cause a delay in your processing of your federal tax uh, return. IRS is making 2023 another transition year to implement new requirements under the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. Uh, this changed the 
Form 1099-K reporting threshold for payments taxpayers are getting through selling goods or providing a service that's over $600. The previous uh, reporting thresholds will, will remain in place for 2023. This means that payment apps and online marketplaces are only required to send out Forms 1099-K to taxpayers who receive over $20,000 and over 200 transactions. For tax year 2024, the IRS plans for a threshold of $5,000 to phase in uh, the other reporting requirements. There are some additional tips to ensure you receive timely and accurate statements. You should confirm that each payer has your current address before the end of the calendar year. Review all the forms for accuracy. If you find any discrepancies, contact the payer immediately and request the payer issue a corrected statement as soon as possible. If you're unable to obtain your year-end statement, income statements from your employers, you can call the IRS for assistance. Um, we have an 800-829-1040 number, um, but you always want to wait and, and give uh, time for the employers to send that information to the IRS, so always wait until the beginning of February at the earliest. So the IRS has an integrity and verification operations. So, um, so why is this important to use the year-end income figures? Uh, the IRS's computer systems compare that income that you reported on your tax return to what's been reported to the IRS. Uh, when income and federal income tax withholding don't match what the IRS has from, on file from the payer, this will cause a delay in the processing of the return and a delay in any refund that might be issued. Um, just for an example, you report $300 of federal income tax withholding on your return. Your employer, however, reported only $30 of federal income tax being withheld on your Form W-2. The difference can cause a delay in processing your return, and as a result, any refund that you claimed will be delayed as it doesn't match what was reported to the IRS. This is why it's so important to review your payer information forms when you receive them. That way you can contact the payer to get the correct uh, process started as soon as possible, or a correction if you need it. And if you can get the discrepancy resolved before filing, then your return and any refund will not be delayed when this verification process uh, is done. So double check that your information is correct for you, your spouse, and your de dependents. Check the name, spellings, the taxpayer identification numbers, social security numbers, um, ITIN numbers, adoption taxpayer identification numbers, dates of birth, addresses, your own bank account information for accuracy. Um, as previously mentioned, if any of these items are incorrect on a payer statement, contact that payer and get them to correct it too. Um, you must have a valid social security numbers for all your dependents before filing. And that may not only delay processing of your tax return, but in certain instances, it can disqualify you from some refundable uh, credits, like the earned income tax credit, which I'll discuss in a couple, uh, a few minutes. Um, some banks may reject a return or a direct deposit if the account holder's name does not match the tax return. Uh, for example, if you have a new baby or a new dependent, you want to apply for that social security number or um, individual taxpayer identification number with the IRS early. Both of these processes take time, so start the process as soon as possible. Uh, to prevent identity theft, you can apply for identity protection personal identification number, IP PIN, um, if you choose. And IP PIN, or identity protection PIN, is a six-digit number that prevents someone else from filing a tax return using your social security number or ITIN number. The IP PIN is, a, is federal and is known only to you and the IRS. It helps uh, the IRS verify your identity when you file electronically or a paper tax return. The fastest way to receive an IP PIN is by using the online Get IP PIN tool. Um, it's usually generally available starting mid-January through about mid-November. And don't confuse it with any PIN that may come from uh, the state of Idaho. That's a uh, verification tool that they use. So check uh, for all credits and deductions for which you're eligible. Review the tax form instructions to ensure that you can claim all these deductions and credits. A lot of eligibility requirements um, for these items often change every single year. 
The forms and formulas used to calculate them can be complex uh, to complete. Uh, generally, family-related credits and deductions are the areas that we see most errors and one of the main reasons after income and wage mismatches that cause return processing slowdowns. Uh, follow the instructions carefully, double check your en entry information, and always, always recheck your math. The link on this slide uh, is, shows the family credits for which you may be eligible. And we'll review a few more of the common family-related credits. Um, you review the tax form instructions, or if needed, contact a tax professional to ensure that you correctly claim all the deductions and credits for which you're eligible. Be aware that the IRS.gov has several interactive tax assistance tools online tools that will help you determine if you're eligible uh, for a particular credit or deduction and uh, the amount or a rough estimate of, about the amount. Many will also tell you what form and schedule to claim them on, link you to more detailed instructions on how to do that. Um, we'll cover the EITC. Um, it is, <laughs> and we'll do a refresher of the EITC. It's always important to keep this EITC or earned income tax uh, credit requirements in mind as a lot of tax return errors involving claiming this credit and other uh, related filing status incorrectly. Earned income as well as other taxable income figures into the adjusted gross income or AGI that's claimed on your return. The AGI must be the same or less than a specific income limit each year. This varies from year to year. Income limits also change based on the number of children that are being claimed and uh, the different filing statuses that are used. Easiest way to determine if you're eligible to take the credit is to use the EITC assistant tool on irs.gov. It's just irs.gov backslash EITC or just put EITC in the search field. Uh, it's also available in Spanish. But by answering questions and providing basic income information, you can use the assistant to find out if you're eligible for the EITC, determine if your child or children meet the test for a qualifying child, and estimate the amount of your credit. Um, you, your spouse, and anyone being claimed for the EITC must all have Social Security numbers that are valid for employment before the due date of the return, including extensions. Um, filing status, married filing joint, head of household, qualifying widower, or single. If you file as married filing separate, this is the only filing status that does not generally qualify for the earned income tax credit. Uh, there is a small exception for 2021 and, and after, um, a careful exception under the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. Um, you must be a U.S. citizen or resident alien all year. If you or your spouse, if married, were a non-resident alien for any part of the year, you cannot claim EITC unless your return status is married filing joint. You can use that uh, filing status only if one spouse was a U.S. citizen or resident alien and they choose to claim or treat the non-resident spouse as a U.S. resident, making all of the worldwide income taxable the United States. Um, there's more information on uh, Federal Pub 519, the U.S. Tax Guide for Aliens. If you have foreign income that's reported on uh, Form 2555 um, or 2555-EZ, uh, this will disqualify you from receiving the Earned Income Tax Credit. There, there are instances where you may still qualify for the credit even if you don't have a child or if you have a grandchild that's living with you. Um, you, to see if you meet the rules for those without a qualifying child or, again, a qualifying child in special circumstances, um, go back to the irs.gov EITC uh, webpage. So, 2023 EITC in information. You show proof of earned income, have investment income of $11,000 or less, uh, have a valid Social Security number by the due date of your uh, 2023 return, including extensions. Meet the adjusted gross income for your filing status. Be a U.S. citizen or alien, resident alien all year. Um, even if you've taken the EITC in a prior, prior year, it's still worth receiving the EITC or reviewing the EITC information. Use the EITC assistant. 
Um, TAS has an EITC uh, Get Help page um, before you file your tax return. Uh, please realize there are consequences that can occur for incorrect EITC claims. Uh, those can include delay of the EITC portion of the refund until the error can be corrected. If that happens, the delay can take up to several months. Uh, denial of all or part of the EITC. If it's denied, you must pay it back, um, plus interest. Um, you may need to file a special form, 8862, um, information to claim refundable credits after a disallowance uh, to claim EITC again in the future. If the error is because of reckless or intentional disregard of the rules, the IRS can ban you from claiming the EITC for the next two years. If the error is because of fraud, the IRS can ban you from claiming EITC for up to 10 years. Last but not least, know that if you claim the EITC or a child tax credit on your tax return, by law, neither the IRS nor TAS can issue your refund before mid-February. Um, however, generally those refunds do start to get released around the first week of March. You'll need to check irs.gov for information on when the refunds will be released exactly. Um, we don't recommend calling the IRS or TAS prior to this time frame um, looking for that refund. It's just a little bit too early. I'll go over some common EITC errors and then we'll skip to the next subject. But each year we continue to see the same types of errors around the EITC eligibility. Um, improper EITC payments remain a huge issue every year. Um, some common errors, claiming a child who doesn't meet the residency and relationship requirements. The biggest dollar amount of errors is someone claiming a child who's not their qualifying child. Again, review the eligibility options carefully to ensure the child's relationship to you is one of the eligible options and determine whether the child lived with you for more than half the year. The next big error identified is incorrectly reporting income or expenses, particularly on Schedule C's. The third most common error is filing a single or head of household when somebody's married. Make sure you claim the correct filing status. A uh, quick note, a married individual may be eligible to file as head of household in certain situations. More information, again, go to the irs.gov. And then last but not least, um, we see errors causing um, the name and social security number to not match the IRS and social uh, security administration records. This continues to be a big problem. Watch for spell spelling and uh, double check the social security number. Another part of this is someone else may be using the child's social security number. You need to ask yourself, did the child live with anyone else during the year or is there someone else who may claim this child? Some other, uh, let's talk about some of the other credits and deductions that are available. Uh, the link on the bottom of this slide is the IRS's credits and deductions page. Includes the most common ones, but not necessarily all of the ones that are available. And I won't go through all of the ones today, but let's review a few of the ones where we commonly see uh, errors being made. So the credit for other dependents is a tax credit available to taxpayers for each of their qualifying dependents who can't be claimed for the child tax credit. The maximum credit amount is 500 for each dependent who meets certain conditions. These include dependents who are age 17 or older, dependents who have individual uh, taxpayer identification numbers, dependent parents or other qualifying relatives supported by the taxpayer, dependents living uh, with the taxpayer who aren't related to, to the taxpayer. The credit begins to phase out when the taxpayer's income is more than $200,000. And this phase out begins for married couples filing a joint tax return at $400,000. Um, a taxpayer can claim this credit if they claim the person is a dependent on the taxpayer's return. They cannot use the dependent to claim the child tax credit or additional child tax credit. Um, the dependent is a U.S. citizen, a national, or resident alien. Taxpayers can claim the credit for other dependents in addition to the child and dependent uh, care credit and the earned income credit. Taxpayers can use the instructions for Schedule 8812 to help them determine if they can claim the credit for other dependents. Again, it can get quite complicated quite easily. 
Um, so education credits. You need a Form 1098-T tuition statement from an eligible educational institution to claim the education expenses. Schools have, again, until uh, January 31st to provide this form. It can be provided by mail or electronically. Um, if not received by early or mid-February, you'll need to contact the institution to get a copy. We've seen several cases in the past where this credit was claimed when a tax uh, return preparer completes a return. But the taxpayer never actually attended school. So double check any and all credits uh, claimed on your return, especially if somebody else is preparing it for you before you sign it because you are responsible. Um, and also make sure if you receive a 1098-T that it's accurate, the amounts paid to prevent possible uh, issues claiming this credit. Um, another big one is the premium tax credit, also known as a PTC. It's a refundable credit that be helps eligible individuals and families cover the premiums for the health insurance purchased through health insurance marketplace. If you didn't know in certain circumstances, you may also qualify to get advance payments of this credit. And if you do get the benefit of advance payments, in any amount, you must reconcile the total credit that you're eligible for with the amount of your advanced uh, credit payments for the year um, on form 8962 um, premium tax credit. So the marketplace will send you a health insurance marketplace statement or a form 1095A generally again by the end of January the 31st um, of the year following the year of coverage. The form shows the amount of the premiums for you and your family's health care plans. Uh, the form includes other information, advanced payments made on your behalf, that you'll need to compute um, your premium tax credit and to reconcile the advance credit payments on the Form 8962. Uh, the Form 1095A does not get attached to the tax return, but it is needed to complete the Form 8962. Um, there is more information on the IRS.gov health insurance marketplace statements. Um, for this credit, you must meet certain requirements, file individual income tax, Form 1040, 1040NR, um, or 1040SR, uh, with the 8962 attached. Um, you can visit the links on the slide for more information about qualifying for the credit and how to claim it if you can. For years 2021-2022, uh, the American Rescue Plan temporarily expanded eligibility for the premium tax credit by eliminating the rule that a taxpayer with household income above above 400% of the federal poverty line cannot qualify for premium tax credit. But similar to a, a year-end wage statement, filing your return without reconciling your advance payments uh, when claiming the PTC may delay your refund, and in this case may affect future advance credit payments as well. As with any missing attachment, the IRS will correspond with you to secure the completed form before they can finish processing your return, which can take some time. And some time usually doesn't mean weeks, it usually means months. So another reminder, before filing again, gather all your records first. Make sure that you have the documents that support every amount of income, deductions, credits that appear on your tax return. Develop a system that, similar to what Cynthia talked about, that keeps all important information together. Uh, may include a software program for electronic records or a file cabinet for paper documents in labeled folders or envelopes. Having records readily at hand may preparing a tax return uh, much easier. Any income document that shows federal income tax was withheld must be attached to your return uh, if you're filing by paper. If you're filing electronically, follow the software provider's instructions, but you always want to save that information as backup. Uh, remember, your last paycheck or pay, paycheck stub is not a guarantee to be an accurate statement of your annual earnings, and it could be missing some information that you need to file that accurate tax return, which again may delay processing of the refund. So be sure your payer's fin final end form and statement is correct. Uh, if you received unemployment compensation this past year, know that some states don't mail those forms, the 1099-Gs out. Um, some agencies paying the benefits will issue people who receive the unemployment benefits in a prior year of Form 
1099G. The agency will either automatically send a hard copy or if they don't mail the form, recipients will need to visit the agency's web website to get an electronic version of the form. Taxpayers must report the unemployment compensation income and withholding on the appropriate lines of their federal income tax return. Uh, there's more information in Federal Pub 525, taxable and non-taxable income uh, information. Taxpayers who received a federal tax refund in 2023 may have been paid interest. Refund interest is taxable. Um, must be reported on federal income tax returns. Um, in January, the IRS mailed the forms INT to anyone who received interest in 2023 of totaling $10 or more. When claiming certain credits, as I just described, a lot of them require a specific schedule or form to be completed and included with the tax return. For each credit or deduction claimed, check the form's instructions for when an additional schedule is required to be completed and whether that schedule needs to be submitted with the uh, tax return when it's filed. We'll switch a little bit. Uh, if you need help preparing your tax return, there are some resources and information, free, free help. Um, we have it both on the irs.gov site and on the taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov webpage. You can get free help uh, if you meet certain income qualifications from trained volunteers. Uh, the IRS has a Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, otherwise known as VIDA, and a Tax Counseling for the Elderly, or TC TCE program, which both offer free tax help for taxpayers who qualify. The VIDA sites offer free help to people who need assistance in preparing their own tax return, including um, generally people who make uh, $60,000 or less, persons with disabilities, and some limited English-speaking uh, taxpayers. The TCE program offers free tax help for those who are 60 years um, age or older, specializing in questions about um, pensions and retirement-related issues that are unique to seniors. Before going, though, to a, either a VITA or a TCE site, you can visit um, the website and look at publication 3676 for services that they provide. Check out what to bring to ensure that you have all the required documents and information that they're going to need to help you. Um, finally, you can use the VITA and TCE locator tools on irs.gov uh, to find a site near you. Just simply pop in your zip code. Um, IRS has a free file program. It's a public private partnership between the IRS and many tax return uh, preparation and filing software industry companies that provide their online tax return prep and filing for free. It provides two ways for taxpayers to prepare and file their federal income tax returns online for free. There's guided tax return preparation, providing free online tax prep and filing at a US or IRS partner site. Um, IRS partners deliver the service at no cost to qualifying taxpayers. Taxpayers whose AGI is $73,000 or less qualify for free federal tax return prep and filing. Um, there's also free file, free file fillable forms. Say that five times fast. <laughs> but these are electronic federal tax forms equivalent to a paper form 1040. Um, someone should really know how to prepare your own tax return using the form instructions and the IRS publications if needed, but it provides a free option to taxpayers whose income or AGI is greater than the 73,000. IRS free file lets qualified taxpayers prepare and file federal income tax returns online using guided tax return prep software, safe and easy to use and no cost. Uh, those that don't qualify can still use the free file fillable forms. Individual tax return filers, uh, regardless of income, can use IRS free file to electronically request an automatic uh, tax return filing extension if you need one. Um, and then taxpayers in certain disaster areas do not need to submit an uh, extension electronically or on paper. But there's, again, irs.gov to check to see if you qualify and the due date of your return if it's been extended. If you want to get help of a tax professional, um, that's an option too. 
You can do your own research online. Uh, the IRS provides a tax professional locator tool called a Directory of Federal Tax Return Preparers with Credentials and Select Qualifications. Um, please know that anyone can be a paid tax return preparer as long as they have the IRS prepare tax identification number called a P10. However, tax return preparers have differing levels of skills, education, and experience and expertise. Uh, the information on our return preparer credentials and qualifications on the website and how to avoid unethical ghost return preparers uh, is valuable. There's also information on making a, a complaint if you've been financially impacted by a tax return preparer's misconduct or impro improper tax return preparation practices. Um, E-file it. This we recommend wholeheartedly, just like the Idaho State Tax Commission, electronically filing your tax return whenever you can. It is faster, more accurate, it's more secure. If you've been hesitant in the past to switch over from paper, now is the time to make that move. There are many choices when it comes to using uh, personal tax return filing software programs. If you don't qualify for the free tax help or you just want to complete the return yourself, most will walk you through step-by-step by, step by completing the form, asking you questions, and can be done on your personal computer, uh, sometimes on your mobile phone too. Um, one caution, when using this type of software programs, if you use the same software program over and over, um, you know, that you used last year, you want to check that only the current year information is present and that the prior year data didn't pre-populate the fields with the prior year information. Double check your figures before hitting submit. So direct deposit. Any of the tax return filing options, including a paper tax return, allow you to choose to have your refund direct deposited. It's free to you. It saves the government and you money. It's the fastest way to get your money. You can even split your refund into one, two, or three financial accounts. You can buy savings bonds too. Just go to the irs.gov and search the words direct deposit to get more information, including information on how to open a bank account if you don't already have them. Those without a bank account can learn how to open that account at an FDIC insured bank or through the National Credit Union locator tool. Veterans could see that or should see the Veterans Benefits Banking Program for access to financial services at participating banks. Um, using a bank, though, account that belongs to someone else may cause delays receiving your refund. Uh, there's also a direct pay option. So be aware that the IRS provides several different ways to pay should you owe a tax balance. One of them is called direct pay. Um, you can use this secure service to pay your taxes for the 1040 series, your estimated taxes if you have to pay them, or other associated forms. Uh, directly from your checking or savings account at no cost to you. All payment options can be found at irs.gov uh, pay, the pay tab um, on the menu tab. Just look at the main menu to find this page. So another bit, if you have to, uh, you can still file a paper return. <laughs> However, the error rates on paper returns are very high. Simple math errors are common. So double check your arithmetic. In addition, with the pandemic still affecting uh, both the IRS and TAS, paper returns um, are some of the last items to get processed, which will delay any refund due much longer than if you e-filed it. If you're filing a paper tax return, be aware that the IRS recently changed a few of its uh, return mailing addresses along with the PO boxes. Um, Review the form's instructions, go to the irs.gov, the link on the slide, to determine where to file your paper uh, tax return based on whether you're receiving a refund or making a payment with your return. Uh, the page has mailing addresses for all types of returns, individuals, corporation, partnerships, and many others. Uh, and each form, of course, has its own page with the needed address, 1040, 1040SR, 1040X, uh, 7004, forms 941, uh, etc. So taxpayers or tax professionals can still use certain private delivery service or PDS, uh, DHL Express, FedEx, UPS, 
that are designated by the IRS to meet the timely um, mailing is timely filing or paying rule for tax returns and payments. There's more information on that or for that on the IRS.gov. Um, and last but not least, make sure that you sign your tax return before sealing that envelope if you're filing paper because it, uh, IRS will stop it and not process it. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the options the IRS has for better communication with all types of taxpayers. Uh, if someone needs instructions or notices in another language, they need an interpreter help or need other IRS or task communications in a different language or format, um, I'll let you know what's available and how to request that. So we have uh, multilingual resources. We know that tax information can be hard to understand in any language. It can be even harder if that information isn't offered, offered in the language that someone knows best. IRS is now translating tax resources in more language. Uh, currently, uh, IRS.gov offers basic tax information, English plus 20 other languages. You can just look for a listing of the languages near the top of each IRS.gov webpage and online tools, and then click on the link for the language you need. Uh, you'll also find many IRS tax forms, schedules, publications, social media challenge in multiple languages. Uh, TAS's website resources currently were limited <laughs> to English and Spanish. Um, there's international services. If you're a taxpayer with specific individual or business account questions, uh, you should contact the International Taxpayer Service Call Center uh, by phone or fax. Uh, these account questions can relate to various topics such as overpayment status, balances owed, correspondence received regarding international tax forms. Um, and don't forget, low-income taxpayer clinics or LITCs are also available to represent low-income individuals who have a tax dispute with the IRS, and they provide education outreach to individuals who speak English as a second language. Um, their service are usually nominal or um, more free or for a very small fee. Um, so if you want to request uh, to receive certain IRS information in language that you prefer, you can fill out a Schedule LEP the request for change in language preference, uh, and send that in with your individual tax return. There are 20 different languages that you can choose from besides English. Uh, just complete the form, file it with your individual tax form. Again, the form itself is available in English and Spanish on the IRS forms and publications page. Uh, if you e-file schedule LEP, you don't need to send it in a uh, paper version. Um, interpreter services. So if you can't find the answers to your tax questions in, in the language that you know best at irs.gov, IRS does offer help in more than 350 languages with the support of professional interpreters. Uh, assistance in English and Spanish, you can call the 800-829-1040. Um, all other languages, the 833-553-9895. But the IRS can provide an interpreter using, it's called OPI, or over-the-phone interpreter services, for most of its taxpayer-facing functions. This includes the Taxpayer Assistance Centers, those walk-in offices, uh, during the IRS exams in person, and for any questions over the uh, telephone um, related to a correspondence exam. Uh, when dealing with the IRS, uh, a representative discussing tax collections and for appeals meetings and conference calls. So if someone needs an interpreter to help uh, you understand, you can just ask the IRS employee to use the over-the-phone interpreter service option. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days per week, and is no charge. Um, and then we have the international taxpayers who need tax help, um, and we also have numbers for that, the 267-941-1000. Um, so, available options for obtaining accessible tax products. If you need a tax product in an alternative format, you can download it from our uh, accessible forms and publications page on irs.gov. You can request uh, paper copies in braille or large print uh, by calling the tax form uh, telephone number at the 800-829-3676. And then uh, IRS notices. 
So once an election is processed, the IRS will send a standard print copy of the notice with an alternative media copy and attach any um, enclosed with the written communications in that alternative format as well. You can use that Form 9000 alternative media preference and attach it to your tax return or call the tax assistance telephone line. Um, for taxpayers with disabilities, there's an accessibility helpline to answer questions related to current and future accessibility products and services that are available. If you need accessibility assistance, you can call the 833-690-0598. Um, assistance for multilingual taxpayers will also be available with the OPI. Um, but please note that if you call these numbers, the staff working this helpline will not have access to uh, taxpayer account information and cannot answer tax related questions. They're only there to help you um, get the information in the language that you need. So now I'm going to switch topics and spend a little bit of time discussing the latest tax scams and how to spot them and, and fight back. Um, in this presentation, I'm focusing on tax scams and schemes that affect taxpayers and what the IRS finds to be the most common ones. Um, common scams typically, scams typically involve a scammer posing as an IRS agent or a tax return preparer. They'll text your phone. They'll tell you what, that you owe money. They can be very persuasive and very intimidating and scary. They'll tell you you're eligible for a refund when maybe you already know that you're not. Um, this is just all a ploy to get your personal information uh, so that they can steal your money. So the IRS has the um, annual dirty dozen list of tax scams for 2023 that I've listed here. Um, this is a reminder for taxpayers, businesses, tax professionals to watch out for these schemes throughout the year, not just during tax season. There are a list of 12 scams and schemes involving topics such as offering uh, help creating online accounts, donating to fake charities, claiming refunds and credits such as the employ employer or employee retention credit that put taxpayers and uh, the tax professional community at risk of losing money, uh, personal information, personal data, and uh, much more. So we'll talk about the employee retention credit, the ERC. Um, it's a complex tax credit for businesses and tax-exempt organizations that kept paying employees during the COVID-19 pandemic when they were shut down due to a government order, when they had the required decline in gross receipts during certain eligibility periods in 2020 and 2021, or when they qualified as a recovery startup business for the third or fourth quarters of 2021. The IRS continues to see aggressive marketing that lures ineligible taxpayers to claim the ERC. While the credit is real, many promoters are aggressively misrepresenting who can qualify for the credit. In many instances, the IRS has seen businesses, again, and exact tax-exempt organizations being misled by these promoters, thinking that eligible when they're not, and then trying to uh, charge all kinds of sky-high fees, 25 to 50 percent of the refunds. Um, so the IRS continues again to see the variety of ways promoters can lure businesses, nonprofit groups, and others into applying for the credit. They've got aggressive marketing. The ERC ads, you've probably seen them on TV, are appearing almost everywhere, including radio, television, online, phone calls and text messages. There's direct mailing. Some ERC promoters are sending letters to taxpayers from non-existing groups like the Department of Employee Retention Credit. Uh, scammers will create these letters to look like official IRS correspondence or an official government mailing with language urging immediate action. Um, they're leaving out key details. Third-party promoters of the ERC often don't accurately explain the eligibility requirements or how to calculate this credit. They make broad statements suggesting that all employers are eligible without evaluating the employer's uh, individual circumstances. In addition, many promoters don't tell employers that they can't receive the ERC 
on wages that they've reported as payroll costs if they received the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a loan forgiveness program um, under COVID. If somebody has incorrectly claimed the employee retention credit, uh, they can use the ERC claim withdrawal process outlined in the IRS.gov. This is withdraw my ERC um, if all of the following apply. If someone made a claim on an adjustment or adjusted employment tax return, and this is the forms 1041X, 10, uh, not 1040, excuse me, 941X, 943X, 944X. Um, if someone filed an adjusted return only to claim the ERC and someone made no other adjustments. Um, if you want to withdraw the entire amount of your ERC claim, um, if the IRS has not paid your claim and the IRS has, or the IRS has paid your claim but you haven't cashed or deposited that refund check, um, requesting withdrawal means you, you're asking the IRS not to process your entire adjusted return that includes that ERC claim. If the IRS accepts your request, the claim will be treated as if it was never filed. And this is a huge, continues to be a huge, huge thing that even TAS has, has seen uh, a lot of um, these promoter schemes. So uh, warnings of the e ERC credit scams, unsolicited calls, advertisement, mentioning an easy application process. It's a complicated credit. Uh, statements that the promoter or company can determine the ERC eligibility within minutes or before any discussion of the employer's tax situation. ERC, again, is a complex credit that requires careful review before it's applied. Uh, large upfront fees to claim the credit, like the 25 to 50% of the refund. Fees based on a percentage of the refund um, or the amount claimed. Promoters telling businesses to claim the ERC because they have nothing to lose. Those that improperly receive the credit could have to repay it along with substantial penalties and interest. Uh, promoters telling businesses to ignore the advice of their trusted tax professional, huge red flag. Uh, these promoters may lie about eligibility requirements. In addition, anyone using these promoter services could be at risk of someone trying to steal their identity and use their information to take a cut of the improperly claimed credits. Anyone who incorrectly claims the credit must pay it back, um, possibly, probably, with um, penalties and interest. The next two slides, we're just going to go over the eligibility. Um, the IRS really wants to help taxpayers avoid the situation. I mean, they've stopped all of the ERC amended return claims and are carefully going through every single one of them. And so even TAS, we're telling individuals who have either a claim or are curious about the claims to go and look on the irs.gov website. There's a two-page or a one-page uh, form that uh, lists uh, the eligibility requirements. Uh, for instance, did somebody have employees and pay wages to them between March 2020 and December 2021? Um, during that time, were they self-employed or um, who didn't have employees, were they a household employer? Um, did a trader business experience a significant decline in gross receipts during the eligibility periods during 2021 and the first calendar quarters of 20, or 2020 and then the first three calendar quarters of 2021? Sorry. Um, look, again, this uh, slide is also a one-page eligibility requirement available on irs.gov. And we're telling anyone who's returns, who's claimed the ERC to go back over this um, slide and make sure that they have all the proper documentation to support the claim for this credit because the IRS is looking at it. They want to prevent uh, billions of dollars in fraudulent claims from going out the door. Um, but the other, other eligibility questions, were you a recovery startup business um, that started after February 2020? Uh, the new trader business doesn't need to be pandemic or recovery related, but there's a lot of things that, that work into this ERC credit. So really know before somebody is trying to have you claim it that you're eligible for it. And then I'm going to switch 
to some other credits, whoops, to some other credits that we see um, misused. Uh, so the fuel credit claims, the fuels tax credit is meant for off-highway businesses and farming use. Um, as such, it's not available to most taxpayers. However, we've seen tax, per, tax return preparers and promoters that are trying to entice taxpayers to inflate their refunds by incorrectly claiming this credit. IRS has seen an increase in the promotion of uh, filing certain refundable credits using the form uh, 4136, credit for federal tax paid on fuels. Um, social media schemes. So, trending on social media, you see a lot of fraudulent form filing and bad advice. Um, there's a rarely used form 8944. There's fraud with that. Um, there's always fraud with the W-2s. Um, scam emails, they display the IRS logo and seem to be legit, but they use subject lines such as tax refund payment, recalculation of your tax refund payment, um, but they can circulate, social media can circulate super fast, inaccurate, misleading, or misleading tax information. IRS has recently seen several examples. These involve common tax documents like, the, again, the Forms W-2 or more uh, obscure uh, ones like the Form 8944. 8944 form is a real form, but it is intended for use by only tax professionals who request to file paper uh, in lieu of an electronic uh, tax return. Both schemes shown um, encourage people to submit false, inaccurate information in hopes of getting a refund. Scam emails display the IRS logo. Again, use the subject line, such as tax refund payment, recalculation. It asks people to click on a link and provide their social security numbers, birth birth date, address, driver's license numbers, other personal information, in order to submit a fake form to allegedly claim their refunds. And what they're doing is just stealing your um, your information so they can file uh, false returns. So how taxpayers can verify information. Keep in mind, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, IRS.gov has a forms repository that uh, has legitimate and detailed instructions for taxpayers on how to fill out the forms properly. Use IRS.gov official IRS social media sites, accounts, or other government sites to fact check information. When in doubt, always verify and check it out. Um, a little bit on the bad tax return preparers. So some warning signs. Um, some ask for cash-only payment without providing receipts. They involve invent false income to try to get their clients more tax credits, and this may be like Schedule C's. Uh, they claim fake deductions to boost the size of refunds. Um, they may refuse to sign a tax return that they prepared. They may ask you to sign a blank return. They may charge a fee based on the size of the refund that you're getting. Uh, the direct de deposit or their refund, they may insist or they may change a bank account number and have it go into their bank account versus yours. Again, we have uh, the links on the slide. Uh, you can understand or better understand the tax return preparer credentials and qualifications. Uh, there's director of federal tax return preparers with their cr credentials and select qualifications. Um, but really, first, taxpayers should choose a tax preparer as carefully as they choose a doctor or lawyer and watch for some common warning signs. I think Cynthia mentioned, you know, trust your friends, your best friends, ask them their opinions. This is, it's a, it's a big deal. But uh, some of the other common warning signs, again, include charging a fee based on the size of the refund. Uh, those gas or ghost tax return preparers refuse to sign that tax return. Um, never sign a blank tax return. Uh, you should always rely on a trusted tax professional if you're not doing them yourself. And the IRS offers that variety of resources to help. I think there's another web page that says choosing a tax return preparer. Again, remind me with these reminders of what to look for and what to look out for. So some more other ways to spot tax scams and IRS impersonators. 
they're calling you first. They're leaving pre-recorded voicemails and it may sound super urgent. Uh, they're emailing you, they're sending you texts, they're contacting you versus social media. The forms they're sending or referencing don't appear on the IRS.gov website. Um, some of the latest tax scams. Uh, these are individuals or promoters, you know, let us help you apply for the employee retention tax credit. Get a large refund by creating your own form W-2. We recalculated your tax refund. You need to fill out this form. Uh, let us help you sign up for an IRS account. Let us help you file a casualty loss claim. We're calling from the FDIC and we need your bank information. We're calling to let you know your identity was stolen and you need to buy some gift cards to fix it. Uh, that's a huge scam in the last few years. We'll cancel your social security number. They can't do that. Um, this is the Bureau of Tax Enforcement. We've seen letters and phone calls from that. And they, again, get very intimidating. We're putting a lien or a levy on your assets. If you don't call us back, you'll be arrested. Um, use this odd, odd form to give us your personal data. When in doubt, check it out. Go to the irs.gov webpage or call the IRS directly, not the phone numbers on the letters that you may have received, but go to the irs.gov website and uh, check contact us page. Um, so if somebody has a uh, return filed um, and improperly claimed a credit or deduction, if a return was filed for you that improperly claims the credit or deductions, again, you're responsible, but you should file an amended return as soon as possible to remove the inc incorrectly claimed items. Um, if this is true, it's if you improperly claim credits or deductions on last year's return, but the IRS uh, still issued the full refund. Um, as general, or generally, the IRS has three years to audit a return. However, if the IRS has reason to believe that your return is fraudulent, it has an unlimited amount of time to audit the return or examine it. Um, even if the preparer, not you, had the fraudulent intent to evade tax, it's still your return and it's still your responsibility. Um, however, if you did receive fraudulent advice, if you claimed ineligible credits or deductions based on fraudulent advice from a tax preparer or somebody else, you should file a Form 3949A, Information Referral. If you were unaware that the fraudulent credits or deductions were claimed on your return and your refund was diverted into account under the preparer's control without your knowledge, again, double check your uh, bank information, um, you should file a Form 14157 the return preparer complaint or the 14157A tax return preparer fraud or misconduct affidavit to report the preparer. In addition to filing those returns, you'll need to file an accurate original return, include the required supporting documentation that's listed in the instructions on the uh, forms 14157. And it will delay any refund that you might have uh, been expecting. Um, so, it is a good time to explain your rights as a taxpayer, too. Uh, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights outlines the 10 fundamental rights that taxpayers have when working with the IRS. Uh, IRS adopted the Taxpayer Bill of Rights as proposed by our former uh, national taxpayer advocate and then codified them into law. Uh, they apply to all taxpayers in their dealings with the IRS. They group the existing rights in the tax code into 10 fundamental rights and make them clear, understandable, and accessible. Those rights are the right to be informed, the right to quality service, the right to pay no more than the correct amount of tax, the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard, the right to appeal an IRS decision in an independent forum, the right to finality, the right to privacy, the right to confidentiality, the right to retain representation, the right to a fair and just tax system. Um, each right is further defined, uh, for example, the right to be informed. It says taxpayers have the right to know what they need to do to comply with the tax laws. They're entitled to clear explanations of the laws, the IRS procedures of all tax forms, instructions, publications, notices, and correspondence. 
They have the right to be informed of an IRS decision about their tax accounts and to receive clear explanations of the outcomes. Bottom line, though, is know that you have rights when dealing with the IRS. Uh, TAS consistently works on your behalf and strives to ensure that those rights are respected. Um, and there's full explanations on both the IRS.gov website and the taxpayer.irs.gov websites. Um, this is uh, resources, IRS resources, uh, tax tips, use caution when uh, using tax advice or tax return preparers, especially found on social media. Um, again, the dirty dozen, uh, taking tax advice on social media can be bad news. It'll list the, the 12 uh, 2023 dirty dozen tax scams and give you more information about, um, you know, being cautious. Um, and then the warnings. Scammers work year-round, staying vigilant, um, different hints and tips uh, to, to keep you safe and keep your options safe, or your information safe, excuse me. So this last two slides, really, I just want to provide a bit of information about how the Taxpayer Advocate Service can help you, maybe help yourself um, if you need it. Our website, taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov, has self-help information on many tax-related topics step-by-step -step instructions on how to work the problem through with the IRS. Um, our website's designed to help taxpayers and tax professionals alike. Uh, parts of it are available in Spanish as well as English. It can be viewed on a, a cell phone. Uh, the website screenshot on the slide shows the, our main Get Help page. Uh, if you select View All Help, you'll be presented with a search box where you can search for specific topics or put an IRS notice number. In. Uh, we also have an interactive tool that you can put like a, a CP2000 notice and it'll tell you what it means, where your return is stuck in the process, what actions you should take and what actions maybe you shouldn't take. Um, and we're d continuing to develop that. It's only got about a thousand notices in it now, but it, it still offers some help. We uh, just started a new TAS virtual assistant that bubble at the bottom of the bottom right, and it can help guide you to the correct information by giving you specific prompts and identify steps to take. Um, we have digital tools called estimators that can help you with determining eligibility for certain healthcare tax credits um, and estimate total uh, credits that you may claim. Uh, at the bottom of the page are two buttons that'll take you to the listing of your rights as a taxpayer and a contact us page, and usually that's by um, zip code. But I mean, once you choose a topic close to your issue, you'll hit, see information kind of laid out. What do I need to know? Uh, what should I do? How will this affect me? Wait, I still need help after getting through those. A resources and guidance page um, and section. And then there's a related content section that provides additional information on topics in related articles, links to other related get help topics, and a link to the taxpayer roadmap, again, to, to find out where you are in the tax process. And then um, always help with federal taxes. You may be eligible for our help if you can't resolve your tax problems through normal IRS, IRS channels. We help taxpayers whose IRS problems can cause financial difficulty or significant cost. You can go to, again, our website, taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov, and use the eligibility tools. Always try to resolve your problem with the IRS first, but if you can't, then come to the Taxpayer Advocate Service. We help all types of taxpayers, including individuals, businesses, uh, nonprofits. Uh, so if you can't resolve your tax problem through normal IRS channels, again, we, TAS may be able to help. Uh, you may be eligible for our help if your IRS problem is causing you financial difficulty or significant cost. If you qualify for our help, your advocate will be with you, assigned to you, and then with you at every turn and do everything possible to resolve your, your issue. Uh, our services tasks are always free. There are no charges or fees for any of our help. Uh, we have over 25 years of experience with the IRS in uh, resolving IRS issues that allow us to be effective advocates for you. Um, again, we have new online tools that help you determine if it's time to come to us. Um, and you can just go to our link, or if you go to irs.gov, you scroll down to the bottom, it'll 
list the Taxpayer Advocate Service, and then you can click on that, and it takes you directly to our website as well. So, uh, again, I urge you to check out Taz's website or sign up to follow us on social media for information, good information about tax help and the latest tax-related relate, news. Like the uh, Idaho State Tax Commission, we have Facebook, we Twitter, or X. Um, we have a TAS, our NTA has a blog uh, that she does once or twice a month. Uh, they have newsletters, et cetera. I did uh, want to finish and let you know that as part of TAS's outreach and education activities, we also hold problem-solving day events um, in each state. During these type of events, you can bring your tax account-related information notices that you've received from the IRS and the other documents uh, for TAS employees to review, and if we can assist you, we're going to resolve it right then and there. If not, then, uh, and you qualify for help, we'll open a case and work with you until the issue is resolved. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Steve and Cynthia and say thank you very much, people, everyone, for attending today. Thanks, Don. So, yeah, there was a question there from Thomas. Are the slides available for, for uh, reprint? I have a PDF version of them. Uh, if you send me an email at taxtraining at tax.idaho.gov, I can send those to you, um, and then you can have them for your own use. Uh, I thank everybody for coming. I hope you got some good information out of this. Um, if you've missed it or you want to watch it again, we have another one of these. Uh oh, when is it? Do, 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 in March? I think it's March 19th is the next one. Um, and, yeah, that's the end of it. <laughs> Thanks so much for attending. Seems kind of anticlimactic. I followed this, but thank you for attending. Uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>